All right, well, today we're going to be looking at God as our daddy, our daddy father. And probably you know this, but people struggle with God as dad. And the reason that we struggle with it is perhaps uh, because of our earthly fathers and some of the things that happened in those relationships. Some people have uh, an abusive background where their father was uh, abusive to them, even cruel to them. Um, others have had a good father, and yet God is a perfect father. And so it's hard for us to uh, translate. We, we end up putting a little grid concerning our, our earthly relationships. We take that and we superimpose it upon God the Father. And I can't tell you how many times that I've been in a counseling situation and I know others who've been in counseling situations where the image of God was the big deal. Um, and the image of God was typically taken from a church setting. Perhaps they were hurt uh, in a church congregation. Perhaps they were hurt by a pastor. Perhaps they were hurt by their earthly father or mother, but a parent figure in their life. And so... In order to understand the goodness of God as a father, sometimes we have to uh, be willing to say, all right, what happened to me happened to me, but it doesn't define my worth and it doesn't define my value. And it also doesn't determine what my relationship needs to look like with God. And that God is perfect. God is a good father. He is a giver of good things. And we're going to see that today. I'm excited about this message so let's jump right in. First of all, Jesus shows us the Father. And uh, for a lot of us growing up, perhaps, we heard beautiful things about Jesus, didn't you? I mean, Jesus is so kind and loving. Jesus is so soft and good and merciful, showing mercy to sinners, talking about love and talking about the comfort of the Holy Spirit and talking about the vine and the branches and him and you and you and him. And Jesus is so soft and good and kind and loving. But then somehow, we, when we look at the Father, or perhaps even the term God generically, we end up with a totally different view or a, a very different view at least. And so God is ticked off at us, but boy, Jesus is merciful. God is angry with us and he's frustrated with us and we're out of fellowship with him and our prayers are hitting the ceiling and and God wishes we were more and we're not enough and God wants more from us more 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 do more be more but boy Jesus Jesus is so merciful so kind so good gave his life for us but God the father oof, I'm not sure where I stand with him and so we end up with this sort of duality, not on purpose, but mom and dad, our earthly parents factor in, our religious experiences factor in, and we end up with this duality of this beautiful, kind, loving Jesus, and then this Father God where we're not really sure, and then you throw the Holy Spirit in and things get really weird. I mean, the Holy Spirit is coming down on me, He's convicting me all the time, all He does is point out everything I do wrong. We're going to see today, that's not the way God is. And Jesus shows us who the Father is. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he says. John chapter 10, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. I mean, look, we're sheep. Aren't you a sheep? I'm a sheep. You a sheep? Sheep is the plural of sheep. We are sheep, right? And, and that's not bad. But... <laughs> But it's true. And so we need things to be put simply, don't we? And here Jesus is putting things simply. I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen him. Make no mistake, I'm not misrepresenting. I didn't uh, go off the rails in the way that I presented myself. If I presented myself as this, then this is God. God's life given for you. God's life given to you, God choosing to invade our ugly reality, live among us, be one of us, 
give up equality with God as if it were something to be grasped, and he gave it up and became a servant to us to serve us through the cross and resurrection. Fully God, but fully man, didn't have to do it, did it anyway. You'd think that's humiliating for the God of the universe to stoop so low and take on human flesh after we have a fallen world and he enters into our world instead of blowing up, getting mad, getting ticked off at Adam and Eve, he pursues them, clothes them, and ultimately comes to be as one of them, one of us. He does the exact opposite of what we might do in the face of disrespectful rebellion. And that shows us the Father. I and the Father are one. Philip wasn't so sure. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Clear as day, in your face, right here, loving, kind, merciful, teaching, comforting, counseling, guiding. I'm here. I've been here with you, Philip, the whole time. And in fact, it's going to get better. I must go away and then I will come again, the comforter living in you. It's going to get even better than this. But make no mistake, my Father is good. And the goodness that you've seen in me, that's your Father. Matthew 10, I threw this in here because it really, it it shocked me in a way. I don't know if I've paid attention to it over the years, but I love this passage. Look at this. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And here's what he says, it is not you who speak, and here comes a peculiar phrase, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. What? No, 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 we've got the Trinity, Jesus. You you can't do this. The spirit of the father. No, 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 don't you understand? It's the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's keep them separate, okay, Lord? And look what he does. He brings the Spirit in, and then he talks about the Spirit of your Father. And then Paul in Romans 8 talks about the Spirit of Christ. And now we're going, what? Who's who's on first? Right? It's a who's on first routine as we're looking at first base, second base, third base, trying to make sense of the Trinity. And Jesus has taken all of it and turning it upside down. And the reason I present this to you is I wonder if you've ever thought about the Father being in you. You know, it's one thing to have the Father with you, to have the Father among you, to have the Father up in heaven who is for you. But I wonder if you've ever thought about the Spirit of the Father being in you. Maybe, like me, maybe you've lost your Father. Or maybe you have had a a cruel or abusive Father. Or maybe you've had a human good Father, but they fell short simply because they were human. What does it mean to us to have the Spirit of the Father Himself indwelling us? Just think about that. Not merely the Spirit of Christ, not merely the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of the good Father Himself residing inside of us. It is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. We talk about Christ in you, Christ through you. Here it says the Father is in you, the Father speaks through you. Jesus answered him and said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Here's another passage where our neat and tidy theology of the Holy Spirit's presence gets expanded. Things are blown up. I mean, We will come, God plural, the Trinity, the Godhead, we will come and make our home with Him. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as I love to say, wherever you go, there's four of you, you're never alone. And so this is an incredibly powerful passage. Next, we we, got to see, all right, if He's in me, and he relates to me as father, if he's daddy, which was sacrilegious, by the way. I mean, the things that Jesus said about God were absolutely sacrilegious. The things that the early church said, the Jews would have loved to get their hands on those early Christians 
And tell them what's what about this calling God, Daddy, you don't do that. That Abba word, you remember, that Abba word is reserved for little kids and their earthly fathers because that relationship is close and visible and obvious. And you might see somebody in Jerusalem, in downtown Jerusalem, a little kiddo about this high, grabbing on to his father's tunic and tugging at it. Abba, wait. Abba, 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 wait up. I mean, Abba, you don't call God Abba. And that's what Jesus was doing. And he was inviting us in to do the same. And so we need to see the Father is good. You know, uh, I was in college and my dad, uh, he would write me letters. Now, we had typewriters. I know that's hard to believe. But back then, we had typewriters and we even had computers. But my dad would love to handwrite these letters. And these were not small letters. And I was a freshman in university, and I was scared and insecure. I had gone to a high school where there were 16 people in my graduating class, five boys in high school with me, five boys, and, and three of them were named John. So that was an easy life. I mean, I only had to know two names. Right? John and the other guy. I mean, yeah, there were different spellings, but basically it was John and the other guy. And then me. You know, growing up in a small high school, it gave you a sense of security. I mean, I was a student body president. There were a few hundred people in the school from kindergarten to, to 12th grade. And uh, I was popular and I was funny and uh, had a lot of friends, at least five. And, you know... <laughs> I was doing well. And then you get to college, then you get to university, and man, the world changes. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, people from 200 high schools are there. We don't know each other. We're thrust into this freshman year on a freshman hall, and we're trying to relate to each other. And I'm telling you, these letters from Dad, they helped me a lot. They helped me a ton. I would go to my mailbox about twice a week and just see if there was one this week. And these were not small letters. These were six and eight and ten page letters. And they were handwritten and they looked a lot like what I've got on the screen there for you. Impossible to read. But that was kind of fun. It was like decoding a secret message. And it took longer and therefore it lasted longer. And so I relished every word. And I mean, my dad was saying things that men don't often say to their sons. My dad was telling me that he loved me, that he respected me, that he thought the world of me. He would pour out his heart in these letters. And honestly, I couldn't believe it. He was bolder with his emotions and affection in print than he was in person. And so I would cherish these letters. And I would take my time with them. And then I would write him back, and we had a dialogue going. And I could have picked up the phone, and I did that too. But this was a different way to engage. Now, I wonder if you see where I'm going with this. Do you realize your daddy father has written you some incredibly passionate things? We're going to explore a bit of it today. But he thinks the world of you. And as you get what he's actually saying to you, you can cherish and relish. People talk about Bible study and you just kind of want to, it's a spiritual discipline, they say. You just want to chuckle. I didn't have to discipline myself to go to that mailbox. I didn't have to discipline myself to open that envelope and start reading. I didn't have to discipline myself to get to the end. God, you know, my dad wasn't timing me. He wasn't keeping score back home. Wonder, wonder if he's gotten to page three yet. And you see what we've done? We've legislated relationship. And we've made it about the book instead of the author of the book. And we've made it about the time, the, the consumption of time in reading a text rather than seeing the Father's heart. It's a love letter. He's trying to say, I'm for you and I'm with you and I'm in you. No matter what, I think the world of you. Look at this, James 1, 
every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He's good all the time. He's good to you every single time. He doesn't change. You can count on his goodness. He's consistent. He's not going to double talk on you. He's not going to change the contract on you. You're forgiven. You're righteous. You're accepted. You're loved. He's not going to put a fly in the ointment. He's not going to put a worm in the apple. He's not going to trick you at the last minute. You don't have to be afraid of the final judgment. He's dad now and he's dad then. Every good and perfect gift is from him. Matthew 6, you can trust him. That's what Jesus is saying. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. They're not frantically working like you people. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You know what this is saying? You can trust Him. He's a provider. You can trust Him. Similarly, in Matthew 7, a chapter later, I mean, you got to realize, Jesus is trying to teach unregenerate people about the goodness of God. I mean, these people, they don't have Christ in them. Christ is still with them. He hasn't gone away, so the comforter can come. So they're just trying to wrap their human brains around this simple concept of God is good. And that's pretty much it. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, unregenerate, still in Adam, if you know how to give gifts, good ones, to your children, how much more... Will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him? And what's the number one good thing He gave you? Himself. He gave you Himself. Now, would it be good if He gave you Himself and then revoked it? People teach this and people believe this. And that kind of God is not the God depicted right here. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You can trust me. You can mess up. It can be messy. It can make no sense. You can feel nothing. You ever felt nothing? I've had periods of my life as a Christian where I felt nothing for a day, a week, a month, maybe on and off a year. I mean, there are times when we feel barren emotionally. And yet he's there. He's there. He doesn't need us to feel something. Imagine if you were to raise your children requiring them to feel something. I mean, that's, that's manipulation. He doesn't require us to feel something. We don't relate to Father through our feelings. We relate through our knowing of His goodness. And that's why we can count ourselves alive to Him. Count yourself connected to Dad. That's what He wants. Nothing thrills Him more than kids who believe Him. Just trust Him, even when your feelings don't line up. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us, this is part of these good gifts, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, every time Easter rolls around, I talk about why the resurrection is a big deal and Most Christians, you know, they hang the crosses around their necks and we celebrate the cross and we have them on our church buildings and we see them all over. You drive down the highway and you might see them on a hilltop in some places around the country. I mean, the cross is celebrated. But here we see the gift of the resurrection. The good Father has gifted you with the resurrection life of Christ. You're born again of the resurrection. So if you call yourself a born-again Christian, do you know that it's not because of the cross? The cross forgave you. The resurrection made you born again. It's It's the gift of resurrection life, all tied up in a package, the resurrection life of Jesus given to you, a person risen from the dead living in you, and he's good. Here's one. My mother is now a widow, so when I read this, it brought me great comfort, and I know that uh, she believes this. Father of the fatherless and protector 
of widows is God in his holy habitation. So do you see what he's doing here? He's saying, I'm good, and I'm good to those who don't even have fathers, and I'm good to those who are widows. You know, we're called the bride of Christ. We're never alone. Never. God is good, and his presence is good, and his presence is constant no matter what. Ephesians 1 similarly says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Here's another good gift. Blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so you say, what does this do for me? Well, somebody knocks on your door or you visit a church or you're chatting with a friend in a coffee shop and they say, it's great that you're saved, but... And they're about to tell you that God is not good, but you may not see it. It's great that you're saved, but God is holding out on you. There's more that you need to get from Him, and you don't have it yet. You know what they're saying? God is not as good as you thought. You are not complete. You are not blessed with every spiritual blessing. You need to go hunting and fishing and hoping and waiting for more of Jesus. There's a second blessing. I know every spiritual blessing, but there's one more. One more. And then you'll finally have it. You've got to have what I have. Do you have the gift? Have you had the baptism? Do you have the portion? Do you have the extra? Have you reached the other level? God is holding out on you. Sound familiar? Satan in the garden a long time ago. God is holding out on you, but if you will just eat of this, then you will be even more like him. He's been holding out on you, but I'll show you the way. Huh? And so this sales pitch continues, and it's actually an assault on the goodness of God, whether we see it or not. People are saying, God is not as good as you thought, and he's holding back. And this says, no, no, every spiritual blessing already given, past tense, you're complete. Amen? Next we see, we are his children, he's our dad. John 8 why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. He's talking to unbelievers. You are of your father the devil. That is not nice. That is not politically correct. We need to smooth that over, Jesus. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Now, I put this in here. Not to put a downer on today's message, but I want you to see something pretty incredible. There is a link between who your father is and what you want. You see that? You are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. Now I would argue that once you're saved, God has reversed that. You are of your father God and you want to do the desires of your father God. But many Christians, we don't teach this and we don't believe this. What we're telling people is God is good and you are not. But you need to try to get good. And so we're saying, God is your father, but your father is the devil. That's what we're saying. We don't realize we're saying it. God is your father, but your father is the devil because you want bad things. If we were consistent and biblical and straightforward, we would say, God is your father and you want good things just like dad. New heart, new nature, new spirit, oneness with Christ. Let's be consistent. It is not the truth to tell someone they are bad, but they need to act good. Go against yourself, go against your nature, go against your personhood. Be someone you are not. And later in heaven, you'll become something. Many Christians are wrapped up in that duality. And that's what legalism is. We use this term legalism all the time. Rule-based. Why you got rules? Because you're supposedly dirty and rules will clean you. 
because you're supposedly dirty. You don't want good, so the rules will tell you what to do because your heart can't. You're evil. Do you see that theology, how messed up it is? The gospel starts with God is good. The gospel continues with God made you good. And the gospel finishes with, so you now want good, and he's prepared good things in advance for you to do. So we see in Romans 8, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Daddy, 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 Father. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And look, he has to pause kind of. He says, and so we are. Like he almost can't believe it. And so we are. Here's a Jewish man who grew up as a Jew, never using the term Abba for God. And so he says, and so we are. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Let me tell you something. You may not always listen to the leading, but the leading is there. The presence of the dad who cares is always there. We think, uh, well, some Christians are led. All Christians are led. If you are led by the Spirit, you're a child of God. That's the definition of a child of God. A child of God is led A led person is a child of God. There's no difference. We don't always walk, but we're always led. Therefore, I love this this impetus, this uh, motivation, this inspiration. These are the Greeks, and they're dirty, rotten Greeks. At least they were. The surroundings, as I often remind you, right? I mean, this is Corinth, and it's like Vegas, and it's like spring break, and it's like Mardi Gras, and it's like... Miami Beach uh, on spring break. I mean, this is crazy stuff here. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. The inspiration for being separate is sonship. I remember when I was a teenager, somebody in our church, they had a license plate and it said sonship, S-O-N, ship, sonship. And I never forgot that license plate because every Sunday morning when that car was parked there, it was a beautiful reminder walking in that, you know what, I'm dad's, I'm God's kid. I'm God's kid. And that's the primary relation. Some people, they, they believe their identity is missionary. They believe their identity is pastor. They believe their identity is businessman or nurse or attorney or or, or whatever. And we fashion identities for ourselves that might crumble. What we need to see is sonship. That our primary identity is children of God. And that's the reason to come out, be separate. But now, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. I love this from Isaiah 64, because he's basically saying, I know you're fragile. I know you're delicate. I know you get hurt easily. I know you're frail, but I know your design. And I'm gentle towards you, and I take care of you, and I fashioned you, and I hold you in my hand, and I keep you close to the vest. And I protect you and I guard you and I'm good towards you. And I'll never let you go and nobody can snatch you out of my hand. I'm good. How many times do I need to say it? I'll say it over and over. I'm good. And I take care of your delicate frame. Next we see the Father has fully forgiven us. I think this is a struggle. As much as we talk about forgiveness in this church, I still believe that this is a big one. I'm amazed that I can be a Christian for 10, 20, 30 years, and I see other Christians who are believers for decades, and we still doubt. We still doubt our forgiveness. I spent a night in jail. I won't spend too much time on it because I've told you before, but I spent a night in jail. I guess I was, I think I was 17 years old, just starting that freshman year, and I'd been getting those letters from dad, right? 
But one night, uh, showing off for a girl who was sitting next to me in this car, I was coming home from IHOP, because that's where Christians party, right? IHOP, the International House. Of, well, they've changed it, right? Is it now the International House of Burgers or something? That just makes no sense. That was a, that was a bonehead move, all right? Let's go back to the IHOP. Anyway, that's where I was, coming home from IHOP, midnight, and the police officer turns on his lights. I might have been going five or seven over, but I decide it's time to go 50 over. And so I hit that gas pedal, just like any 17-year-old would do, right? No, do not do that. But I did, and I ran away, and it lasted a few miles, and I got up to 142, and I'm weaving in and out of the traffic, and then... I stop at the gate to get in the university. The security guard steps in front of me. He's heard those screeching tires coming around the exit. And I get stopped. And when I'm stopped there, then the police officer catches up to me and uh, says, What are you doing? Why are you running? And I, you know, my 17-year-old brain thinks of a brilliant response. Uh Uh-uh. And then I go to jail for a night. I'm in there five or six hours. They... Decide I'm in good standing at the university, first offense, and they let me out. But now i got to tell mom and dad, I don't have a car anymore. I can't use my car. Lost my license in South Carolina. Got to tell mom and dad, and I'm headed home. I think it was spring break. I'm headed home, going to get a ride home, and then i got to tell them. And I tell them. I sit at the foot of the bed. I can't wait till the next morning. It's late, but I wake them up. I sit at the foot of their bed, and I tell them. And I'm expecting a lecture, and I'm expecting them to teach me and show me and punish me and get me even in worse trouble. And that their first question is, are you all right? Are you safe? And from there, there were tears, but tears of concern. There was never anger, no wrath. I was shocked. I went back to university and wrote them one of those long letters about how they had showed me the love and grace of God, and I never forgot it. It meant the world to me. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For we, he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. You guys remember the prodigal son story, right? I mean, we don't have time to tell it again, but if you were in church since you were this high, you know a son goes astray, he comes home. On his way home, man, he's got that speech prepared, kind of like me coming home from university, ready to tell him what happened. He's got this speech prepared, and I mean, it is elaborate. Father, I'm a dirty worm, Father, I stink as a son. Father, I don't deserve you as a dad. Father, I've done these horrible things. I betrayed you. I disrespected you. I abandoned you. Father, I stink. And the dad won't have it. Here's his response. He arose and came to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, speech was ready. His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And then he says, let's put my son in the finest robes. And I'm sure the son is ready to apologize. You've seen many times in the movies when the, the camera comes in close, somebody wants to talk, and the other person goes right on their lips, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know, that's what the father's doing. Let's put you in the finest robes. My son has come home. Let's celebrate. You know... Let's get the best animal we got. Let's have a feast. Let's have a party. Welcome home. I don't need your speech. Welcome home. Lastly, we see the Father comforts and teaches us. We'll finish with this. I had a Superman doll. Okay, I was six, all right? I mean, I had this Superman doll and... It meant everything to me at six years old, not because it was Superman, but because it was soft and plush and I would sleep with it. I don't know. I'd probably been sleeping with this Superman doll for a couple years and I was addicted to it and I needed it. It was my comfort. So my dad, he decides, you know, let's go camping. So we lived on a farm and so I don't know, it felt like nine o'clock at night. It was dark. We get all our equipment together and we start walking across the farm. I mean, this is a pretty good distance. We, 
we walk uh, about three quarters of a mile maybe, maybe a mile. And we pitch the tent. We lay out the sleeping bags. I mean, it felt like forever. First, it's dark. And second, I'm six. So I'm not much of a help. So my dad is prepared this tent and he's putting all the stakes in the ground and then we're laying everything out and he's got the pot ready for the morning with the fire and we're going to have this father-son experience and we lay down to sleep. Now, now it's 10, 10.30 at night. Everything is set. You can tell he's exhausted. He puts his head down. I put my head down. Six minutes later, I'm crying. I'm whimpering. I'm trying to hold it back. I know it's going to be a big deal. I don't want him to blow up. But I have forgotten my Superman doll. I cannot sleep without my Superman doll. So I'm holding it back. Gosh, what if he blows up? What if he gets mad at me? I'm going to look like a wimp. I remember feeling all this. I'm so ashamed. I'm so embarrassed that this has happened. Now he's going to see that I'm not a big man. I'm a dependent little boy. He's going to see me for who I am. It's going to be embarrassing. I'm shoving back the tears. I'm trying to be quiet, but it is just absolutely silent out there in the, in the night in this field. And he starts hearing the sniffling. And then he starts hearing the whimpering. And he says, Drew, what's wrong? And I said, I, I forgot my Superman doll. I mean, it probably sounded even worse than that. I'm trying to save face here. But I mean, I'm just... And you know what he did, don't you? You know what he did. He didn't say, well, deal with it. We're not going home. It's too late. You know what he did? He picked up everything. And we went home. And maybe he was relieved to sleep in his own bed. But I got my Superman doll. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves have been comforted by God. I hope you've seen it today. God is our Father. God is good always to you. God has forgiven you of all your sins once for all. God is your comforter. He's not always trying to teach you a lesson. God is a trustworthy dad. Maybe you didn't have a great dad. Maybe you had no dad. He is father of the fatherless. Maybe you had an awesome dad. But this God trumps all of that. This God goes above and beyond. This God is beyond belief. Far beyond what we could ask or imagine is this God. So my challenge to you on Father's Day, as you father, as you mother, as you live as a person on this planet, a child of God, my challenge to you is, will you consider going above and beyond what you previously imagined? In terms of God's goodness. Will you go above and beyond. What you previously thought about God. And consider the possibility. That he is way better. Than you've been thinking. Because I'll tell you what. He is. He is way better than you've been thinking. Let's pray together. Father we thank you. Daddy father. That you relate to us as kids. That we can be real, that we can show our frailties, that we can be willing to share our shame and our guilt and our embarrassment and our, our frailty and our, our delicate side to you because you care for us deeply and you know our design and you love us and you cherish us and you like us and you'll never leave us and it's safe And you're safe and we're safe. Father, we thank you for this beautiful safety. We've never had a father like you. Our fathers, maybe they blew up at times. They were out of control. They didn't have the right tone all the time. We kept secrets from them. We hid from them. 
We did things behind their back. We couldn't trust them fully. We were scared. Father, we thank you that first you see everything. You can't be shocked. You can't be surprised. And there we are naked in front of you. And yet you embrace us and you love us and you're good to us and you've seen it all and we can't shock you. And wow, we love you. We thank you for this beautiful safety. In Jesus' name, amen.